All right, let's get started. So today it's uh, BERT and GPT, which is kind of like the, the highlight of modern NLP since 2018, 2019, I guess. So everything I'm gonna talk about today is all based on transformers. So there's not much, not, not too much technical details into it. It's more like high level approaches on how to solve problems based on two transformers. And uh, yeah, the, the contents are word embedding, just a simple review, and then moving on to contextualized word embedding, which we already kind of touched upon. Uh, I think it was in the week seven or week eight when we talked about uh, sub word embeddings and word embeddings and stuff. So uh, a brief review on contextualized word embedding, um, more detailed than before. So we're going to look at Elmo and GPT and then move on to BERT and then move on to GPT-2 and GPT-3, which was all the all people talked about for several weeks when GPT-3 came out, which was really, uh, it showed really impressive results. All right, so yeah, word embeddings. So hope you guys already are super familiar with the word embeddings. Um, so word embedding is just expressing a word as a vector. So each word becomes its own vector. So, and hopefully we want similar words, semantically similar words to have similar vector, meaning that they have short distance between the two. So for example, cat and kitty should have, uh, the, the, the distance between cat vector and the kitty vector should be smaller than the distance between hamburger vector and cat vector, for example. So it, like your, your word vector representation should contain some semantic meaning of the given word. So clearly, this is not a this is not a good good word embedding because horse and zebra they are they are similar things. But if you always use one hot representation, then the this, the distance between any given two words are going to be square root of two unless it's the same word. Uh, so it's not a good idea basically. So we came up with, uh, we talked about word to vec, which is based on the assumption that the definition of a word is determined by its neighbors. And uh, we, looked, we took a look at two implementations of word to vec. One was continuous bag of words, SIBO, and another was SkipGram. And we actually had practice use based on SkipGram, the whole practice session. And we already took a look at this. So it was word to vec alone was already capturing some semantic meaning of the words. So for example, we took a look at uh, some fun example like here, uh, like men, uh, king, ma, what was that? King, uh, yeah, king minus men plus woman was, it was most similar to queen, something like that. So already it was, uh, it was quite good at capturing semantics, but but uh, it, it didn't go too much beyond that at the time. So like, even if you had trained word to vec vectors, pre-trained it, and then tried to plug them in into like translation models or classification models or whatever, it didn't give you like, uh, like a dramatic increase of the performance. So then came contextualized word embedding. So we, we already took a look at this motivating example, uh, which was, if you, if you already have a word embedding, pre-trained word embedding model, then you can easily retrieve a, a vector for a given word. It, for, so like when you have a word to vec model, so you pre-train skipgram word embeddings based on like bunch of corpus. And then after you've trained your word to vec or skipgram, then they are fixed. So each word has its own one-to-one uh, -one mapping to another, to, to a set of vectors, to, to a vector. So like a cat has its own vector, kitty has its own vector, horse has its own vector, like everything has a fixed size vector. So once you've trained it, you can just simply use it. You can just plug it in and that's it. So it's a fixed, fixed, fixed vector, but Elmo is something different. So for example, in here, the conversation is that, hey, Elmo, Elmo is, is the word embedding model. Hey, Elmo, what's the embedding of the word stick then? Correctly, it says that there are multiple possible embeddings. Use it in a sentence because 
stick could be either like sticky, you know, like being attached to something or actually like a stick, like a wood. So, so you must use it in a, you must use your word in a sentence to really understand the semantics uh, or what it means basically. So here, they, uh, the user says, let's stick to the impro stick to improvisation in the skit, which is stick to meaning like not changing basically. And that, and the Elmo model says, says, oh, in that case, the embedding is something, 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 something. So it means that your word embeddings are no longer fixed after training. It is, you, you generate your word embedding on the fly, given a sentence. So that is called contextualized word embedding. Words have many meanings depending on the context. Uh -huh. And previous word embedding, previous word embedding, such as such as word of X or or glove, that those type of those types of stuff. Uh, or previous word embeddings represent a fixed semantic. So a kitty is always some vector. A cat is always some vector. So it doesn't change depending on the context. On the other hand, El Elmo, uh, which was the title of the paper, was actually deep contextualized word representation. Uh, it was published in 2018 in NACL. So the, the core message is that the word embeddings should be obtained on the fly. So the architecture is super simple. Like all, all, the, uh, all, all, the, all the techniques or, or like the, all the studies that we're gonna talk about today, like Elmo, GPT, BERT, the architectures are super simple actually. So Elmo is simply a bi-directional multi-layer LSTM and that's it. So you just you have a multi, you have bidirectional LSTM like one like a forward LSTM and a backward LSTM like forward here and a backward here. So this is all forward. This is all backward, and you just stack them multiple times. So you have like a multi-layer multi-layer LSTM. In this particular example, there are one two-layer. So it's a two-layer LSTM, two-layer bidirectional LSTM, and there are residual connections between layers. So just like Resonant connections. There is a residual residual connection between, like, uh, like like here, probably, or or maybe uh, it should be actually it should go like this way actually. So, and yeah, it's trained via bidirectional language modeling. So language model is actually, uh, if you guys remember, so language model is given W. Uh, uh, what is the what is the like the next word to occur given all the past like history like t minus one w t minus two compared to w one so this is based this is basically a word uh, language modeling you given the context or given the history so far trying to predict the next word and then after that the next word and after that the next word so basically language modeling is a forward is a forward modeling. So you like uh, you start with I am a, a good what? So give, given the, given this context, what comes next? And then basically it's this. But you can go you can go the other way actually. You can have a backward language modeling, just like you had forward language modeling. It could go backwards language modeling. So uh, which would be so, so this is forward. This is for this is forward LM. And you can have a backward LM, backward, which is basically what is W1 given this future, like W2 all the way to WN. Uh, Actually, uh, this is a particular, it's a specific example. It should be WT minus T minus one given WT, I guess. Yeah. Basically, you, you start from the beginning. You start from the from the end sentence. Oh, uh, let, let's see. T, W T plus one all the way to W, like capital letter T to the end. So you start from the start from the from the the last word and then you move backwards. So in this entire part, so Elmo is basically just by a direction LSTM. Where the forward LSTM, the forward, the forward RNN, this part, 
this is responsible for forward LM, and this part is responsible for backward LM. So you train. So this this part, this forward LM is trained to predict the next word. So next word, next word, next word, and this backward LM is trained to predict the previous word, the previous word, the previous word, previous word. And once you've trained it, you just simply, uh, yeah, you just simply concatenate them. So you have um, H, let's say B one, H B two, all the way to H B T. And this guy is H, oh, this is not B actually, I'm sorry. It should be forward. So HF forward, 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 and this is H backward, one, H backward, up, backward, two, H backward, P. So once you obtain, you once you have, up, so you train it, and then after you've trained it, you, when, when you deploy it or when you test it, you simply give a some sentence, you give a new sentence into, your LMO, and then it'll generate these sets of vectors, like all the all the H ones from all the H I's from the forward LM, and the, all the H I's from the backward LM, and then you simply take them, concatenate them. So your final context vectors consist of basically what H F one concatenated by H one backward, and this one, the final one, would be H T uh, forward. H T backward. That's it. So that that becomes your on the fly context. So let's say that you want to use it in a downstream task, and the downstream task is sentiment classification. So when you're using one hot embedding, when you're using one hot embedding, and you have an LSTM. Simply, it's a it's a LSTM based sentiment classification. Then, and we've already seen this example. So this movie is as as impressive as Christmas play. So if it's a one hat embedding, then you have like this look uh, word embeddings that looks like this. So which would be the, the simplest case. If you use a word to vec embedding, so you you already have trained a word to vec embeddings for all the words in your dictionary. And then you simply reuse it or plug it in into your sentiment classifier. So for example, you can retrieve a word to vec representation of this, or to make representation of movie, or to make representation of Christmas, of play, and then you simply plug it into your LSTM, and then you fine tune it. And not fine tune, you actually train your LSTM based on, based on this word to vec, word to vec uh, embeddings. So the only thing that is being trained is all here. It's, it's here. Now, when you have, when you use Elmo, then Elmo is simply a replacement for the embedding layer. So you don't actually pre, you don't actually fine tune Elmo. What, once you've trained pre-trained Elmo on forward forward language model and backward language model tasks, then it is actually more or less fixed. You don't. So here the example is there is already a pre-trained Elmo, and then you, what you do is when you want to do sentiment classification, you put your words into Elmo, and then Elmo will generate corresponding embeddings and then sim you simply use that to train your LSTM. So you still need a down downstream specific layer. So if you're doing uh, sentiment classification, you need LSTM layer on top of Elmo. If you're doing uh, like question answering, then you need like canonical question answer models like like uh, bi-directional attention flow. Like by bi there, there's like, there are some like these days, everybody uses BERT, but before BERT came along, everybody had different architectures for different tasks. For example, if you have sentiment classification, you use, you use LSTM. If you, use, if you do uh, question answering, you have a very complicated set of like two stream attention mechanism based LSTM, which is even, which is way more complex than just a single LSTM. So even when you, even if you, even if you use Elmo, you still need a downstream specific layer on top of, on top, on top of the Elmo. So, and then you train it. So at least up to, up to the, up to the, uh, up to Elmo, it was just, Elmo was just a simply a replacement for the embedding layer. And that was it. It wasn't a, uh, it wasn't like a powerful model like GPT or, or BERT. 
It was just basically multi-layer LSTM. All right, moving on. So what they did, uh, the people, uh, the authors of Elmo, they pre-trained Elmo on something called one billion word data set. And their forward language model perplexity was 30.39.7. So of a forward, so a perplexity is exponentiated entropy, basically. So you can, uh, you can crudely inter interpret this number as uh, this elbow model, uh, when, when given, when trained on one B word data set, a one billion word data set, and it can, it can, so when you, when you're predicting, like, for example, I am a good something, then it can narrow, the Elmo can narrow down the identity of this, of this blank word into one of 40 words. So there are, there, I mean, think about this. There are probably more than some, some dozens of thousands of words in English vocabulary, maybe even 100,000 words or maybe even 1 million words. So, and being able to narrow down an unknown word into one of the 40 words or 39.7 words, that is, a, that is, a, 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 that is a, a, a huge achievement, basically. You're narrowing down the, the probability space into like 40, 40, 40 words out of some some dozens of thousands of words. So that is what, that is actually, so you, can, you can interpret perplexity as that. So, and simply adding, simply adding Elmo layer to the baseline gave soda so a state of the art performance. And as I said, fine tuning, so more or less, Elmo is more or less fixed, but what they do is they fine tune for language model using the downstream test data set. They don't fine tune the entire Elmo and its its downstream architecture uh, based on the supervised label of the downstream task. They don't use supervised they don't use supervised labels to fine tune Elmo. They they just use the supervised labels to train the uh, specific arc the downstream specific architectures. So here, the, so why there there's like there should be x and y of the uh, classification sentiment classification pairs, and they use x and y to train only this part. And they use X, which is the input, the, sent the sentences, they use X to fine tune this part with LM, uh, with language model objective. So there are still, there is still some fine tuning going on for Elmo, but it, it is not based on supervised labels, not, not based on, on, the, on the pair. It only uses the X of the uh, sentiment classification data set and then, try, and then fine tune with the, uh, fine tune Elmo with the language model objective. So that's, yeah, not fine tuned via the downstream supervised label, not. And you can see that uh, this, is a, this is a performance table. So compared to, uh, compared to baseline, so for example, th these, are, uh, these are like the previous, previous uh, at the time, at the, at the time of, uh, uh, of presenting Elmo, these were the uh, so, sort of performances for each data set, like uh, question answering, language inference, semantic role labeling, core reference resolution, like different NLP tasks. And what they do is they re-implement some of the well-known SODA, SODA model models. So this is the re-implemented SODA model performance. And they simply add Elmo be below the model as, as a word embedding layer. And you can see the increase like here, 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 here. They, they, they all have, increased performance. So this actually shows the power of contextualized word embedding. It's no longer a fixed word embedding derived from word to vector glove. It's a model that can generate word embeddings on the fly given a sentence. And Elmo was, Elmo actually showed that it works. So it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a seminal paper. Uh, Chimuisition 
아, 애드만 해도 괜찮은데 이, 이때만 해도 컨캣을 했었습니다 이제 엘모의 저자들은 그냥 난뭐 어, 약간 생각하기 싫고 무책임, 무책임하게 그냥 컨캣을 해버리겠다 해도 상관없어요 컨캣이 사실 애드를 포함하기 때문에 컨캣, 그러니까 이제 애드 컨캣 다음에 오는 이 레이어의 웨이트에 따라서 이게 얼마든지 애드랑 비슷한 효과를 낼수 있거든요 그렇기 때문에 이제 나는 확신이 없고 그냥 난 알아서 뭐, 뭐 모델을 해줬으면 좋겠다 그럼 그냥 컨캣 해버리시면 됩니다 다운스트림 테스크는 그냥 이런 것들이 다운스트림 테스크입니다 이제 엘모 자체는 그냥 랭귀지 모델일 뿐이고 그 다음에 이걸 이용해서 뭐 이거, 이걸 이거 이 랭귀지 모델을 이용해 가지고 뭐 감성 분석을 하든 뭐 질의 응답을 하든 뭐 아니면 뭐 개체명 인식을 하든 하여튼 개, 어떤 어떤 특정한 테스크가 있을 텐데 그런 것들을 이제 다운스트림 테스크라고 말을 하는 거예요. 엘모 자체는 그냥 월드 인베딩일 뿐입니다. 그냥 워드 투베딩은 똑같은 역할을 하는 거예요. 그냥, 그냥 워드 인베딩들을 만들 수 있는 모델이고 엘모는 이제 그 워드 인베딩을 만들었으면 그걸 가지고 뭘 해야 되잖아요. 이제 그 뭔가를 한다는 게 바로 이런 것들을 말하는 겁니다. 뭐, 뭐 문서 분류가 될 수도 있고 모든 될수 있습니다. 오케이, okay, moving on to 네. 다, 네, 당연히 업스트림 테스크 같은 건 존재하지 않습니다. 네. 엘모가 시작이고 그 다음에 다음 그러니까 흐름이 이게 강물이 흐를 때 이제 다운스트림은 하류잖아요. 이제 하천이고 이제 상류가 있고 하류가 있는데 이제 엘모가 이제 상류가 따, 상류고 이제 여기서 한 이런 것들 이제 하류에 해당하는 거죠. 네, 파인 튜닝을 네, LM만 한다는 게 엘모 자체가 LM이에요. 그러니까 엘모 자체가 랭귀지 모델이니까 엘모를 파인 튜닝을 하되 엘모 파인 튜닝 하되 여기서 이걸 엔드 투 엔드 여기서부터 여기, 여기 끝까지 다 엔드 투 엔드로 하는 게 아니라 이 X를 가지고 이것만 한 X를 가지고 이것만 파인 튜닝 한다는 거예요. 랭귀지 모델만 가지고 네, 그 엘모의 오브젝트를 엘모의 오브젝티브를 동일하게 이용하되 다운스트림 테스크에 사용할 데이터셋들이 이 데이터셋들이잖아요. 더 이상 1B 데이터셋 쓰는 게 아니라 다운스트림 테스크, 테스크 데이터셋은 따로 있거든요. 그러니까 다운스트림 데이, 테스크 데이터셋을 이용해서 얘를 다시 한번 랭구지 모드 학습을 하는 겁니다. 네, 아마 버트랑 이제 GPT를 보시면 좀더 이해가 잘 가실 거예요. 네. Alright, moving on to GPT-1. So GPT-1, the name of GPT, the title of the GPT-1 was Improving language understanding by generative pre-training. So generative pre-training. So it's GPT. And it wasn't actually a paper presented anywhere. It was just technical report from OpenAI in 2018. I think it was about the same time as Elmo came out, or maybe slightly later than Elmo. And basically, their, arch their architecture is, is super simple. Again, it's just transformer decoder without the encoder decoder retention. That's it. So, and it's trained only via forward language model. So Elmo was forward and backward language model, but GPT-1 is just, just forward language model. And, it's, uh, and they replaced the LSTM with a transformer decoder. And interestingly, GPT-1 actually came up before BERT. So BERT came after Elmo and GPT-1. So uh, yeah, just, uh, just as a remi reminder, so this is transformer architecture. And as I said, GPT-1 only uses uh only uses the decoder part and they don't and since they only use the decoder this whole thing is is out of the picture and accordingly this part is no longer needed because this is this component where this component which is encoder encoder decoder attention is no longer needed because there is no encoder this component is is exists to mix the decoder output with the encoder output but there is no encoder anymore so we don't need this anymore so it's only it's, oh, oh sorry so it's just it's only uh the mask self attention and the feed forward and that's it and then you just stack it multiple times so they pre-train it on something called books corpus and they reach a perplexity of 18.4 which is even better than 40 so they can reasonably or they can on average predict the next word into 18 candidates they can narrow down the candidates of the next word into 18 words which is already like impressive enough and what they do is they use 12 layers uh, 768 hidden, hidden size and 12 attention heads which amounts up to about 110 million parameters so you can see a, a, a depiction of the architecture here 
So there's mass self-attention, then there's fear feed forward. And of course there's layer norm plus residual connections here and here. And they've, they, uh, they repeat this 12 times, basically, 12 times. Yeah. And the output, of the output of the uh, of the transformer of out or the output embeddings or contextualized embeddings are 768 hidden uh, 768 dimensional vectors. Right, and uh, they don't have a they don't they no they no longer use a downstream specific architecture. No no downstream specific architecture. Before in Elmo, Elmo still required a downstream specific architectures on top of Elmo. If there's sentiment classification, you need RNN. If there's if this if it's uh, question answering, then you need some complex architectures on top of Elmo. But here in GPT-1, you all you need is just GPT-1. You don't have a downstream specific architecture, and you just need one additional linear layer for prediction, and that's it. So. Uh, for uh, so if if we're doing classification, for example, this is classification example, then you it's a it's a text classification. Given a text, is it like sports? Is it is it the polis, politics? Is it is it uh, science? Something like that. Basically, is you're you're classifying a given text into several categories. So your input would be start token, some text, and end token, and then so for example, you, your decoder would like look like this. So this is your GPT. This is your GPT-1. You put, uh, uh, let's see, like messy, messy, scored, scored, two goals. I'm assuming that GPT-1 is already pre-trained on the forward language model. So this is already a pre-trained, pre-trained GPT-1. And then on the test time, what you want to do is you want to classify, you want to classify text into several categories. So this is your text messy score two goals. Of course, there should be like start and end token. And the GPT-1 would output the same number of tokens. So there is uh, embedding output one, embedding two, embedding three, embedding four. And what the original, what the authors of GPT-1 did is they took E4, they took embedding four, which is the last word last contextualized word embedding. And then they set, they put a simple, they put a li simple linear layer on top of this. So this is a linear layer. And then classify this into sports, uh, IT, politics, something like that. And then they would treat, they would, tr they would fine tune the entire thing, starting from here all the way to here. So it's in time. So there, since there is no longer a downstream specific architecture, they just simply fine tune the entire, entire GPT-1 per different downstream task. So there could be one, two, three, four, four different downstream tasks, and they would fine tune each and each every each, each single time they want to do fine tuning. They want to do a downstream task. So there would be different GPT-1s for each downstream task. So in this case. You simply take uh, you simply take the last embedding and then put a linear la linear classifier on top of it and then do a classification. If you're doing uh, similar words uh, sentence similarity text, then what you do is that you so again you have a pre-trained you have a pre-trained GPT one. You put two sentences. So it's a sent it's a text similarity classifier. Like given two sentences, how close are they? So you need to put two sentences into your GPT-1. So here, two sentences, text one, text two. And actually there could be another way around, text two and text one. So they do it, they do it. So there's text one, text two, separated by a specific, specific delimit the delimit delimiter. And then again, you take the last embedding and then do a, and then uh, actually no, they, they actually sum it up. Oh, I see, so there's, there's another way you can put these two texts. Well, this is now text two, delimiter, and text one. And then you have the final embedding, final embedding. So you take this, you take the final embedding from, from T1, T2, and you take the final embedding from T2, T1. You add them, add them, and then do 
and then basically calculate their cosine similarity or whatever. And you want to you want them to have a specific score given like if there are if they are similar to text and if they are not similar to text then you want their score to be smaller something like that basically. Uh, these are delimiter. It's a delimiter. It's a delimiter. So yeah, so yeah, the so the characteristic of of GPT one is that it no longer needs us no, no downstream specific architecture, but fine tune the entire GPT on each individual tasks. And they show this on the some yeah they they show some uh, state of the art performance on some specific tasks like uh, language inference. Uh, I think these are all like entailments for language inference tasks. And uh, previous base, previous state of the art was like uh, like somewhere around here or here. And basically, uh, yeah, Elmo, Elmo, Elmo had an 89.3 on here. No, they didn't have, it's all blanks here. Yeah, anyway, so yeah, most of the cases uh, they were able to show state of the art performance specifically on like language in like text inference or text entailment or language inference tasks uh on the yeah these are some simple qa qa style tasks so story the uh, story close is like trying to fill the blanks i'm not sure what race is but again they show like state of their performance Th these are all like before birth actually and uh, this is glue so in glue there are this is a subset of glue actually glue consists of like I think 12 tasks or nine tasks that they only tested against five against five tasks and again they show some great performance in some cases not not all the cases yeah so at least they all win they they outperform elmo all the time yeah yeah so that was the beginning of the contextualized word embeddings so else beginning with Elmo and it and then came after Elmo came GPT one and GPT one already was a humongous model. So compared to bidirectional LSTM, multi-layer bidirectional LSTM, 12 stacks of transformer already is a is a pretty sizable model. All right. So moving on to BERT now. So BERT is is uh, is, is short for Bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. So it's B E R T. Oh, I did I? Oh, I, I actually don't have the names, the title. So yeah, this also came out in 2018, 2018 by people from Google. And uh, this came out late in 2018. So first came out Elmo, and then probably soon afterwards came out GPT 1. And then after that, several months later, uh, Bert came out, and probably may, this is just in, uh, just uh, conjecture, but it was possibly inspired by Elmo and GPT because Bert takes takes the best of the two. So it takes bidirectionality because G Elmo was bidirectional LM, GPT one was forward LM only. Uh, so it takes bidirectional from the L Elmo, and then it takes the powerful transform element from GPT. So yeah, so it takes the best of the two. So this is simply uh, uh, just a simple architecture comparison between BERT, and GPT, and ELMO. So BERT, GPT, and ELMO. So ELMO is bidirectional LSTM. So there's for, forward LM, backward LM. Here, there's just forward LM, but with but with with transformer though, with with transformer, with transformer. But now BERT is bidirectional. I mean. It is not exactly doing language modeling. It is doing mass to language model, something called mass language model. We'll talk about, we'll talk in the next slide. So, but it, it goes both ways. So it's bidirectional. And it has transformer. So let's see what, what BERT actually does. So this is the BERT architecture. Uh, it's simply, just bunch of transformer on top. So there should be actually there is like a, a large transformer on top of this transformer. Uh, tra I'm sorry, transformer encoder only. This doesn't have decoder. This is just encoder. So this is just 12 stacks of transformer encoders on top of the input. But the input itself is a bit 
is, is a bit complicated than before. So there's token embedding. So here we are putting two sentences at a time into transform, into BERT. So there's my dog is cute, separated by, uh, separated by the special token, SEP token. And then there's he likes playing. So this is, this is text one, this is text two. And then uh, you need a positional embedding. Of course, we talked about position embeddings in transformers. So there's position embedding here. There's another thing called segment embedding. So segment embedding uh, kind of emphasizes between the first, that distinguishes between the first text and the second text. So text one, for text one, it is all EA, which is like the first embedding, first segment embedding. And starting from text two, it's all EB. So, and these are both learnable, trainable segment embedding. So there, basically there's segment embedding one, there's seg one and there's seg two, and they are uh, randomly initialized learnable parameters, learnable embeddings. And you just simply use seg one for the first portion and seg two for the second portion and that's it. So you have three, three, uh, three layered embeddings. For, yeah, and you simply sum them up. You just simply sum, 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 sum. So you don't concat them, you, you simply sum. Some like this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, and then that's that's how you get the final input to the transformer encoder. And there's a caveat. So there is a special token called CLS. There's a special CLS token or a classifier token, which is used to represent all input, because there's text one, there's text two, and of course, each uh, your transformer. So there's a transformer layer on top of here. Your transformer will I'll put the same number of tokens as the input tokens. So there's like E, uh, not E, let's call this um, output one, output two, output three, all the way to output nine and output nine and output 10. So this is your output. And sometimes you want to do something about your entire sentence, like your, your entire entire input. So in GPT, what we did in GPT is, what we did in GPT is, oh, do I have it? Yeah, in GPT, we took the final, final contextualized embedding as the representation of the entire sentence or entire input. But here in BERT, instead of doing that, they use a special token CLS here. So there's, they have a special CLS token, which goes through the uh, transformer and then outputs a CLS embedding. CLS embedding at the output. And this is used to represent the entire entire input here, all the sentences. So if you want to do text classification, you use class, uh, you use CLS embedding. If you want to do something else, you, for example, yeah, if you want to do something based on the entire input, you can use CLS embedding instead of using the final, con final contextualized embedding. Uh, question from John Jisoo John, are the token, Yep, token embeddings. So good, great question. Great question. Token embeddings are simply one hot embeddings. They are one hot. Or more 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 likely it's, it's an integer. You you don't actually put one hot embeddings. You don't actually use one hot embeddings because it'll be a waste of vi uh, video memory. So like each word has a specific number assigned to it. So you just put the number into it. Actually, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, this is not 100 embedding. I'm sorry, this, that one, uh, I should have been more clear about that. So this is not 100 embedding. This is a, the word embeddings here are learnable, a trainable embedding. So it has its own embedding. So my, so for example, there is a, uh, uh, let's just call this embedding M and let's call it, let's say that this is 768 dimensional vectors. And this is my somewhere, somewhere in your embed. So this 768 dimensional, this is about 30,000. Somewhere here would be dog. Somewhere here would be cute. So you just simply take uh, you just simply take the embeddings from from this this matrix given your word. So if it's my, then you just take this one. If it's dog, you take you take this one. If it's cute, you take this one. So there is no longer a one hot one hot uh, 
elements anywhere in your in your in your pipeline, basically, because one hot embeddings are a huge waste of memory, huge waste of space. So what you do is my is like number one dot. So this is one. This is like I don't know. Let's say ten ten thousand one to one one to one one zero one two. This is could this could be like twenty uh, twenty twenty thousand twenty seven thousand uh, six one eight. So each word has its own integer assigned to it. So you simply retrieve that row from your embedding matrix. So my is like one. So you take the first first row. You, a dog is like 10,000 12th row. So you take that one. And cute is 276618. So you take 272 row from your embedding matrix. So that's how you retrieve this. And these are all trainable. This is a trainable matrix. So it's just basically a parameter. So that's how you get how you prepare these individual embeddings in your token embeddings. All right, moving on. So no, 30k is this way. This is 30k. So it means that there are 30,000 unique words in your English dictionary. It could be 40k, it could be 50k, doesn't doesn't it's up to you. How many like how many words you want to use is all up to you. And then which dimensionality you want to use to represent each word that's always also up to you it could be 128 could be 256 could be 768 it's all up to you it's, it's hyper parameters all right so bert pre-training so as i said this is not not so bert you bert has this bi-directional bi-directionality but it's no longer a classical language model. It's not trying to predict the next word or the previous word. What it does is uh, it masks, so on randomly, it's randomly masking 50% of the tokens. So previously it was my dog is cute and he likes playing. So now you randomly select 15% of your token embeddings and then mask it. And then then your input would also be masked actually. And then after after your transformer encoder, after your transformer layer, transform encoder layer, you will have the same number of token outputs. So there will be output here, 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 here. Like, like your your BERT your BERT layer will generate the same number of output tokens as the same as the number of input tokens, and here using the masked the 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 correspond the mask corris the corresponding embedding corresponding embedding outputs of the mask tokens which is here and here using this you want to predict its real identity which is based on this you do a softmax classifier on top of this and then you want to choose dog obviously because this the identity of this was dog and the and here you also you do a softmax classifier, and somewhere around here should be sharp sharp, sharp sharp, ing, which is the true identity of, of of this token. So basically, that's all you're doing. So it's called closed task. You're trying to like fill the blank. Filling the blank is actually you see a lot of the a lot of these types types of like tasks in uh, in like in in I forgot Sunung uh, Jiang basically college entr entrance exam, like closed task. Uh, it's the same thing. So it's trying, so what, what, what this mask language modeling, which is called MLM, what this MLM task is forcing the model to do is try to use the context or the neighboring words to predict, it, predict the identity of the mask word. What is the most likely word that should come into this mask, top mask portion here and here? And it is it is bidirectional because you're using both sides as an information. You're using previous words and future words at the same time. The context from both sides to predict the identity of the mask word. So that is why it's called bidirectional. Why it is a bidirectional model. So that's where. It, so the name of that the name of the part the bidirectional encoder is com comes from this fact using context from both sides of the mask mask model or, or not the mask mask word i'm sorry all right so this is the this is the pre-training task number one so first uh, this is mlm pre-training test there's also something called next sentence prediction which is called nsp this is the second 
pre-training objective. And what it does is using CLS to perform, uh, using this, this token to perform a binary task. And the task is, if the two sentences are actual neighbors, like they're consecutive sentences, then the CLS token should be one. Otherwise, it should be zero. So again, there's transformer layer here. There's, there's BERT layer. There's BERT layer. And then there will be a CLS corresponding token output. And using this, if the sentences are, if T1, if, if T1 and if T2 are consecutive sentences, then, then this should be one. If these are not consecutive sentences, for example, like my dog is cute, then like Messi scored two goals, then it's not consecutive sentences. So in that case, it should be zero. So it's a, so it's like, it's a higher level semantic task compared to, compared to simply just trying to, you know, identify a mask word. This is a bit more high level task because you need to understand the semantics of the sentences. Uh, and, but in reality, it's not, a, it's, it's not, a, not, not an essential task. So NSP task is helpful for some downstream tasks, but people actually don't implement NSP in some cases. Like when, when you train BERT model, this is, this is the most important thing, mask language modeling. And NSP, sometimes people use it, sometimes they don't. So it's not as important as ML, M, uh, mass language modeling. So uh, using BERT on downstream tasks, you first need to pre-train BERT on what the authors did is uh, they use books, corpus and English Wikipedia. And they pre-trained BERT on mass language model and the uh, next sentence prediction tasks. And for the mass language model perplexity, perplexity was, uh, very impressive four. So when you have when you when you have a mask token, BERT can narrow down its identity into I into one of the four candidates. So out of 30,000, 40,000 English vocabulary size, BERT can narrow down the identity into four words. So it's like very, very accurate. And they use the same, almost the same architecture as GPT-1, basically 110 million parameters, 12 layers, 600. There's 768 uh, 68 hidden size, 12 attention ads. And uh, so they know, again, it's, it's the same as uh, GPT-1, they no longer use, they don't have a downstream specific architecture on top of BERT. BERT itself can serve as a downstream task performer, downstream task model, but you need different input and output for different downstream tasks. And of course you need to fine tune the entire BERT model. So. If you're doing par if you're doing paraphrase detection, so paraphrase detection is given text one and given text two. Is text two a paraphrase of text one? Are they the same thing? You know, like uh, for example, this could be like uh, like T one could be I not 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 I like John gave Mary. Mary, a present. And T2 could be uh, a present was given to Mary by John or, or from John or by, by John, by John. Something like this, basically. So T1 is a T, paraphrase of T, no, T2 is a paraphrase of T1. So it's a classification test, basically. So you put sentence A and sentence B into a transformer or, or BERT. So there's BERT here, there's BERT. Then you put sentence, sentence one and sentence two separated by the SEP token. And then you have the CLS here, CLS. And you take, you take that CLS corresponding embedding and then, pre, and then you have binary prediction test. If T2 is a, is a, if T2 is a paraphrase of T1, then it should have one it should point to like, it's a binary task. So it should output one. If T2 is not a paraphrase of T1, then it should uh, predict zero basically. So that's how you use BERT to do downstream task. If it's sequence tagging, sequence tagging like, like POS tagging or named entity recognition, then you put text and a pad. So let me erase all of these. So a sequence, a sequence tagging task could be like uh, I am, uh, a good boy, then this is 
Uh, I is a pronoun. It's a pronoun. This is a verb. This is an article. This is adjective. Something like this, basically. So given, given a sequence of tokens, you need to classify each token into some class. That is what sequence tagging is. So, but interestingly, BERT is trained to receive two texts at a time. So there's, so in BERT was, so there's BERT and then there's CLS, there's CLS, there's T1, there's SEP and there's T2. This is how BERT is trained, but in sequence taking, you don't need T2, you only need T1. You want to, you want to like do a, like a POS taking like this. So in that case, what you do is you, you actually put T1 here. So there will be I am uh, blah, blah, blah. There's SEP token. Then there's just null, there's like no, zero pad here. You just simply zero pad or null pad in the second portion of, of the input. And you given this, given given this input here, you'll get the same corresponding CLS here. And then like I am a good boy. There's there will be a SEP token here. There will be SEP. And then there's like zero padded output here. Or null padded output here. And all you do is you just take this and then classify this into different part of speech, classify this into different part of speech, classify this into part, different part of speech, but like, like, like this basically. So this should be pronoun, this should be a verb, this should be an article, this should be adjective, and this should be noun basically. So that's how you do sequence tagging using BERT. Of course you need to fine tune all of this anyway, end to end, to end. like starting from here, you need to fine tune all, all the way down to here. If it's text classification, it's the same thing. You have just text and ped, and instead now you don't need to, work on individual tokens like this, you just simply use a CLS token to do to classify a text into either like sports, politics, IT, science, something like that. All right, question from Chu Yunsang. NSP to JWL train how many CLS embedding T token is now embedding our suite and got to put on scene now. The Pojang of Sir Kudeshine, it downstream test credit, the CLS embedding Yung as downstream test for fine tuning how many are so yega. 알아서 CLS가 얘네들 전부 다 아우를 수 있도록 학습이 되겠죠. 그렇게 학습을 해버리기 때문에. 네, MLM에서는 CLS 인베딩을 따로 다루지 않습니다. 좋은 질문이에요. 그러니까 이제 NSP를 사용하지 않으면은 pre-trained 때. So the question is, if we don't do next sentence prediction during pre-training, then CLS will never be used during pre-training. So how can you guarantee that using CLS for, for example, text classification would work? And the answer is, it doesn't matter because when you do fine tuning, you actually, when you do downstream tests, you fine tune the entire BERT architecture. So when you use CLS for downstream tests, it'll, um, the model will understand to use CLS to represent the entire sentence. So that, so that's okay. Great question though. So, okay, so BERT on downstream tasks. So there's something called glue benchmark data set, which is collection of NLP tasks. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight tasks. Okay, so there, it's a glue benchmark consists of eight subtasks, which are text similarity, paraphrase, detection, inference, entailment, classification, like basically all very semantically oriented NLP tasks. And there's ELMO and GPT compared to that BERT base, which is the same size as GPT, uh, outperforms GPT all the time. So I'll perform GPT all the time. Right here. Okay, this is a very bad drawing, I'm sorry. Anyway, so yeah, compared compare to this and this, you can see that BERT outperforms GPT. And if you enlarge, increase the size of BERT, the uh, BERT architecture into 24 layers in, instead of 12 layers, then you get even better performance. So compared to bird base and compared to bird base, bird large outperforms bird base all the time. So there's no limit basically. So just just you know, just dramatic increase from before, like like El in, back in the Elmo days. Compared to Elmo, bird large is just you know way better compared. Like look at the scores here, like 36, 60, uh, 56, 70, 71, 82. So it's, it's very like dramatic increase within a single year because this was in 2018. 
I think around March. This is 2018, October maybe. Like only only like six or seven months difference, and it is just uh, this is like a revolution. So you can understand why everybody was thrilled or like excited about the uh, the achievements of Bert. And not just on glue data set, also on squad. So squad is a is a Squad is a question answering data set. We'll actually talk about Squad a, bit, a little bit. So Qu Squad is a question answering data set or not, not exactly a question answering. It's more like reading comprehension. Like when, you're, when you take college entrance exam, Suno, uh, there's a bun, yi, uh, bun, bun, yi, yihe, yihe. Basically you, you read a text and then answer questions. You know, like there's, a re there's like a bunch of text, like, uh, Bunak, pimunak, whatever, you know, science or whatever. So there's like a bunch of text and there's a question, there's questions, blah, blah, blah. Like what, what is the intention of the, of the, of the character or, or why did something happen, whatever. And then there's a, then there's like one, two, three, four, it's a multi-choice question. And then you, and then you, you select whatever, whatever is like correct. So in squad, instead of having a multi-choice question, there's text, there's question, and then you need to select a relevant span the answer span in the reference text given the question. So that is squad. And previously, Elmo was able to achieve 85.6, 85.8, whatever. But BERT, uh, it's like 92, 93. This is squad one. Squad two is a bit more complicated. Squad two, squad version two is more, is more difficult than squad one. And the, Previous previous uh, best performance was seventy four ish or something, but Bert is like eighty three. So, you know, like again, dramatic increase. So let's take a look at Squad data set for a brief moment. So this is Squad. So here there's a reference text. So this is some scientific text, and the question is what causes precipitation to fall, and you need to select the correct word in the reference text. And it could be actually a sequence of words. For example, if the question is where do water droplets collide with ice crystals to form a to form precipitation, then you need to select a span of text in your reference text. So that is squad data set. It consists of about hundred thousand questions. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, this is these are like answer types. Basically, it consists of various answer type, answer types. So these are th this is squad one point one. Uh, squad 1.1 consists of, consists of 100,000 question samples based on Wikipedia articles. And they evolved this into 2.0, which has addition, which, have, which has added 50,000 unanswerable questions, unanswerable. So some questions are not answerable based on the text. For example, this is your reference text. And the question is, which laws face significant opposition? And which, uh, let's look at this. So the text says little opposition was raised. So there is no significant opposition because like this question is unanswerable because the text only says something about some little opposition, which is the opposite of significant opposition. So the answer to this should be not answerable. Not answer, answerable, not answerable instead of saying later laws, which is which is a wrong answer. So in squad 2.0, a model, a question answering model have a, a third option or maybe a second, like another option that says not answerable. So so yes, yeah, squad 2.0 is 100,000 question samples in addition to 50,000 unanswerable, unanswerable questions. And the way they measure the, uh, the performance of the data set, performance of question answering is they use exact matching or F1 score. So exact matching is, for example, you need to match exactly within a cloud. So if it's an exact match, it's one point. If it's not an exact match, it's zero point. And F1 score, F1 measure is, it, it accounts for the partial, partial, like partial answer. So if the correct answer being within a cloud, but you say, you say a cloud, then that's like partial, there are partial points given to you. Like, 0 0.66 points given to you, something like that. So in both measures, in exact match and F1 score, currently this is the leaderboard and all, all, the, all the winners like from rank one to rank nine, it's all BERT based. So there's like, uh, 
retro read, uh, let's see, like this is some BERT variant, BERT variant, BERT variant. Electra is also BERT variant, Albert, BERT variant, BERT variant, BERT, BERT variant. Uh, BERT variant. I'm not sure what, what these two are actually, but at least six, one, two, three, four, seven. Yeah, seven out of 10. Yeah, seven, actually eight out of 10. Eight out of 10 models are all BERT based basically. And human performance is, interestingly, human performance is 89, per, 89, point, 89 points. And the first, the first model actually wins human performance. It's super human performance, even on squad 2.0. So yeah, you, you can see how, how, per, how powerful BERT model actually is. So how do you train? So this is a specific example, like how would you fine tune a BERT for a squad? So for example, let's say that you've already trained your you've already trained your BERT for like mass language modeling, next sentence prediction. And now you want to fine tune your BERT on squad data set. And the ref so how you do it is you first have, for, of, of course it's squad. So you need a question and the reference text. So question is how many parameters does BERT large have? And the reference is some Wikipedia text. So BERT large is really big. It has blah, 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 like call, call instance. And you put, the question text first, separate token, then reference text later. And of course there's a CLS token here. Uh, so that's how, that's how you put your input, your question answer pair into the BERT. So there should be like a large BERT model on top of this. And then you put individual tokens here all the way to, all the way to the end. And then what you do, what you do is what you, how you want to train or fine tune your BERT for question answering is, you, the task is to find a span of text in the reference text. So this is your reference part. Like there's, there's a question part here. There's a question, there's a question, question part here. This is reference part. And then you only want to predict based on the reference part because you want to find the span in your reference. And the answer, answer to the question here, the question being how many parameters does Bart large have? It should be three, four, zero million parameters. So it's actually uh, three, four, three, four, zero and M, which is a separated uh, word piece token. So the, you you need to so you need two predictions. You need start span and the end span. You need to predict two tokens. So out of all the tokens, out of all the all the tokens in your reference text, you need to find the start span. I am sorry. You need to find the start of the span. And which should be three, four, zero, obviously, because this is this is your answer. And out of all the out of all the words in your reference, you need to find the end end of the span, which is m here, which is the million. So, but it could also be might as it, it might as well be param, params. So, it, the answer could be either three three hundred four three hundred forty million, or it could be three hundred forty million parameters, or it could be three hundred forty million parameters total. Like all, they are all valid answers basically. So that is why you have like different, like a bit, a bit, uh, a bit like distributed soft mix probability. So yeah, I mean that, that should be the reality. All right. So here, this is actually uh, a copy paste from one of the uh, Colab instances. So this is your question. Uh, this is your question. This is your question, and uh, there's separate token here, and then there's this is your reference text. This is your reference, and we're to, we're doing a start start span prediction. So out of all the out of all the reference text, there is here 340 has a this has this is the only token that has the non like a that is that has the positive logit so this is a, this is not a soft this is not not soft mix this is not soft mix this is a logit <clears throat> so uh 340 is the only token with a positive logit and if you go to the end part so you need to predict the end token and now you can see that uh like three 340 also gets some to some logits million also gets some logits here 
Prems in. What is this? This is exclamation mark. Yeah, anyway, so three, yeah, 340 could be also a valid answer, although it's a wrong answer. 340 is a number, so that is uh, semantically, it's, it's a, at least syntactically, it's a correct answer. And but the highest logit is achieved by M and followed by parameters, which are two, two like correct answers. This, so this is how you train. This is how, how the input and output of the uh, BERT would be if you're doing fine, uh, if you're doing squad, squad data set tasks. All right, so yeah, this is BERT. So in practice session, you won't be doing squad you won't, you won't be fine. You won't be like combining squad with bird because that would take too much time. So what you would do, what you would be doing in practice session is you would uh, implement bird and then see and then train it like a couple couple minutes maybe because you the training bird would take like several days or at least several weeks. So we can't do that on on the practice session. So you would implement bird and then see how it trains at least check if it trains and then fine tune it. And using the BERT already pre-trained somewhere else, you take that and then fine tune it on, sent on sentiment classification. So actually you will be using like a review data set, like positive review, neutral review, and negative review. So it'll be way simpler than squad data set. So simply you take the CLS token to make a prediction. Also, all right, moving on to GPT-2 and GPT-3. So any questions so far on BERT? No question. Yeah, I mean, it's not a it's not a technically challenging model. It's uh, that actually that's the beauty of it. The objective function is really simple. It's just mass language model, and the architecture is super simple. It's just transformer, but you just combine a humongous, gigantic model with a lot of data, and then you can achieve state of the art performance, which is like kind of like the spirit of deep learning actually. You don't need any domain knowledge. You're like you don't need to understand what question answering is. You just have take the BERT model, fine tune it, and that's it. So it's different times. All right, moving on to GPT-2. Can you explain what the sharp, uh, yeah, I guess you might have missed the subword embedding class in week seven or week eight. So yeah, I, I don't have time to go down into what the subword embedding is, but basically you can, uh, so like embedding. So embedding is broken down into M sharp, sharp, bed, sharp, sharp, D-I-N-G. So it's just how you break down a single word into a subword using word piece or byte pair encoding or sentence pieces. We've talked about this in the previous, like, like past classes. So sharp sharp just means that this there is something that comes before BEB, and that the sharp sharp DING just means that there is something that comes before DING. So DING is not the start of the word. And how do you encode bidirectionality? No, there, you don't explicitly encode bidirectionality. Bidirectionality is is injected by doing mask language modeling. Because as I said, if you want to do mask language modeling, uh, yeah, everything, I guess this wasn't explicitly said. Everything is mixed together using self-attention in the transformer encoder part. You mix the entire thing like n times n, like if there are like, I don't know, like 10 times, if there are 10 tokens, then you you have a 10 times 10 self-attention layer and you do it 12 times. So everything is like mixed and math, like it's all combined together in a, to a very extensive degree. And then that's how you get the bidirectionality embedded into, into this specific token so that you're able to predict its, own, its original identity. So that's where the bidirectionality comes in. All right, moving on to GPT-2, GPT-3. 
So GPT-2, it, the title of GPT-2 was Language Models are Unsupervised Multitask Learners. And again, it, was, it wasn't published anywhere. There, it was just technical report by OpenAI in sometime in the midst of uh, 2019. I, I'm not sure when exactly. And they increased the size of the model to, to 10 times. So it's 10 times bigger than GPT-1. So GPT-1 was 110 million parameters, but now in GPT-2, they're using 1.5 billion parameters. So it's 48 layers with 1,600 hidden size. And, uh, and the caveat is the context size is 1024. So the length of the token given to GPT-2, like the number of tokens is 1024 tokens. And now it's, it's no longer trained on books corpus. They trained on something called web text, which is uh, outbound links so it's, it's a scrap from the internet. So it's outbound links from Reddit posts with at least three karma. Three karma is, is like recommendation system. So it consists of 8 million documents of roughly amounting up to 40 gigabytes of text. And they exclude Wikipedia because their benchmark data set, their downstream tasks usually originates from Wikipedia. So it would be cheating if, if they trained GPT-2 on Wikipedia. So they were very, very careful on this. And they were able to achieve perplexity of 10 to 11. So on web text, web text is like, it's a, it's a huge gigantic corpus and being able to predict next word um, or narrowing, narrow down the candidates of the next word into 10 words or 11 words. This is already like very impressive. And the, the most impressive thing about GPT-2 is they only perform zero shot tasks. So they don't even do fine tuning. They just pre-train GPT-2 on forward language model only. And then they do fusion, they, they just, just do downstream tasks without any fine tuning. Or they don't even have a link, they don't even add, add a linear classifier on top of GPT-2. So let's take a look at it. So how do you do, how do, you do downstream tasks with GPT-2 in a zero shot manner? Because you, you still need to tell GPT-2 which downstream task you want it to do. You need to still tell, GPT-2, I want you to do translation, or I want you to, to do, I want you to do text classification, something like that. You need a Q sign. Like how, how do you tell a language model to perform a specific task? And the brilliant thing about GPT-2 is they use textual input to condition GPT-2 for a specific task. So they condition GPT-2. So you have a pre-trained GPT-2, and then on the on the test phase, when you want to test it for, for example, summarization task, like you you have given you have like a very long gigantic text and then you want to summarize it into like a few sentences. Uh, how do you tell? How do you use a pre-trained GPT-2 to do this exactly? And what they do is they condition the model with a few examples, then start sampling tokens auto regressively. So you have GPT-2, you have GPT-2, a gigantic GPT-2 model, and then you put. Uh, the, the span of the text is 1024 tokens. So you put several examples of summarization into the GPT-2. For example, you put long text and then a special Q sign, TLDR, too long didn't read, and then a short summarization. So you put long text, TLDR, then summarization. Again, the long text, TLDR, uh, TLDR, short text, a summarization. Actually, yeah, this should be a, a way longer than this. So this is like GPT-2. And then I'm just gonna erase this. Uh, yeah, you start from long text, TLDR, TLDR, summarization, long text, TLDR, summarization, over and over again. And then you do this, you do it for several times, like one times, two times, three times, four times, like n times. You do it n times. And then after you've done, after you've fed this into GPT-2, pre-trained, pre-trained GPT-2. This is pre-trained GPT-2. Then you do a one final, one final push. So long text, TLDR, TLDR. And then then you start sampling. Then you you say start. Like, like you, you put a special start symbol, or actually you don't need you don't even need a start symbol. You probably just need TLDR and that's it. So you do a TLDR and then start sampling what would be the next word. 
and then auto and then do it do this auto regressively. So that's how you condition a GPT, condition a, your pre-trained GPT-2 to perform a specific task. And if it's translation, then you can do English sentence, uh, special token, which is equal sign, then French sentence, do it for n times, and then English sentence, Q sign, then start then start sampling your, your French sentence. So actually, this is how they did zero shot task. So there is not a single back propagation or fine tuning or anything. It's just, you, you have a fixed GPT-2 model and then just do downstream tasks in this manner. So what they're do, trying to do is, can the model understand what it needs to do by priming or conditioning the model with several examples and then start doing sampling order aggressively. And surprisingly, it does do a pretty good job. Weirdly good zero shot performance on multiple NLP tasks. So these are all, actually the Lambada is like a language model tasks, uh, I think. Yeah, I think these are all language model tasks. So, I mean, GPT-2 is a language model. So it, there's, it's no wonder that it does a good job on language model tasks. So the previous, for example, previous uh, state-of-the-art perplexity on Lambada was 99.8, but they were able to achieve 8.63 using 1.5 billion parameters. So this is, no, this is no wonder because these are all, these, these are all LM data sets, LM data sets. So what's interesting is doing reading comprehension, for example, uh, squad, translation, summarization, question answering, reading comprehension. So these are no longer language model tasks. These are like highly semantic NLP tasks and they are able to achieve a pretty good performance without any fine tuning at all. So for example, translation, so state of the art unsupervised state of the state of the art machine translation has blue score of 25 but they were able to achieve 11 point something ish without any fine tuning at all they just have gpt2 pre-trained on language model and then they then they just do translation using 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 this approach and it was already doing a pretty decent job same same for like summarization same for reading comprehension state of the art or state of the art reading comprehension is like 60 five-ish, but they were able to achieve 55-ish without any fine tuning, which is just mind blowing. So yeah, they were showing the potential of language models of how they can be a great zero shot learner for downstream tasks. And uh, the, there, were, there were some very impressive examples. So uh, it's, it's a, like a news, news article generator, so text generation example. So the, this part, this part is written by humans, and then this part is all generated by GPT-2. Following, following, following this context here. So you prime your GPT-2 with this. You put the, you put these words into GPT-2 after this, and then you start sampling auto regressively after you have put this into GPT-2. And you can see how, how like you know, semantically consistent the generated text is. Uh, let's, I mean, for example, uh, in shocking findings, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote previous unexplored valley in the Andes mountain. So obviously these are all fake because there is no unicorn in, in the real world. So just people just wrote this, this fake thing. And even more surprising to the researcher was the fact that the unicorn spoke perfect English. Again, very imaginary text, but can GPT-2 continue this imaginary text in a consistent manner? And it can actually. So the scientists named the population after their distinctive horn, Ovid's unicorn. So it's just making things up. These four horned silver white unicorns were previously unknown to science and yada, yada, yada. And then they can even come up with the name of a scientist, University of La Paz. La Paz is, is, uh, is the capital of Bolivia, I think, or, or Colombia. So anyway, so La Paz is located in South, is in South America. So that's where Andes Mountain is. So it is, it seems to understand that Andes Mountain is the background, is, is the context of this story. And accordingly, you should cite a University of La Paz, which is located in South America. So GPT-2 is, is that much powerful. Okay, so the meaning of zero shot is, zero shot is 어떤, 거, 어떤 의미인가? Zero shot is, like, 이제 처음 보는 태, 테스크를 그냥 바로 시키는 거예요. 한 번도, uh, 그러니까 이제 학습 약간 여기서 이제 제로샷을 하는 게 약간 의미가 조금 왜곡되긴 했는데 
원래 제로샷은 한 번도 본 적이 없는 테스크를 바로 시키는 거예요. 그러니까 학습도 없이, 그러니까 학습도 없이. 근데 여기서 약간 잘못된 게 사실 처음 본 테스크가 아니죠. 여기서 약간 몇 번의 그 기회를 주잖아요. 이런 식으로 이제 몇 번의 어떤 그 테스크의 이그샘플을 주고 그 다음에 시키는 거니까 100% 제로, 제로샷은 아닌데 적어도 파인 튜닝은 하나도 하지 않습니다. 네, 그런 의미가 있습니다. Anyway, yes, so yeah, this is a mind blowing example uh, of text generation per capacity of GPT-2. Right, moving on to GPT-3 then. So GPT-3, the name of GPT-3 was language models are few shot learners. And it was, of course, performed by OpenAI, presented a couple, couple months before. I think it was like August or, or January or August or something. Or maybe a bit before that. So now GPT-3 is 100 times bigger than GPT-2. Now GPT-3 is 175 billion parameters. So it has 96 layers, 12,000 hidden size, 96 attention heads, and now the context size has increased to 2,048 tokens. TLDR 같은 토큰도 배우지 않았던 건가요? 그렇죠, 배우지 않은 거죠. 네, 좋은 질문이신데 TLDR 토큰도 배우지가 않은 거죠. 그냥 TLDR도 아마 그 TLDR도 그래서 이걸 어떻게 했는지 잘 모르겠네요. 이게 뭐제 코드까지 본건 아니라 가지고 이거를 새로운 토큰을 줘버렸는지 아니면은 뭐 TLDR을 바이트 인코딩을 잘랐는지 모르겠는데 그러게 궁금하네요. 아마 학습을 토큰을 학습을 한 건지 안한 건지 제가 잘 모르겠습니다. 좋은 질문이시네요. 네. Alright, and uh, interestingly, GPT-3 is such a large model that the people involved in developing GPT-3 was 31 people instead of seven people from GPT-2. Because GPT-3 is such a large model, it doesn't fit into a single GPU. So you need to break down a single GPT-3 model into several GPUs. And you need to train it in a distributed fashion. So a lot of engineers were involved in GPT-3. And the estimated cost for training GPT-3 was about four to five million dollars per training. So in Korean, it's like about like 50억. So 50억 원이 든 거죠. 그러니까 GPT-3 모델 하나를 학습하는데 전기세가 50억 원이 든 겁니다. 네. So $5 million spent, burned to train a single GPT-3 model. So waste of, waste of money. Can you say it's waste of money? Like a lot of people are worried that these like in modern, modern deep learning models spend too much money and emit too much carbon footprint footprints in developing AI machines. And some people claim that AI machines can solve the climate climate problem or like you know the weather problem. But I think it would it could be better not doing AI research at all because they they generate too much carbon carbon footprint these days, which is ironic. Anyway, so it, it is so GPT-3 is trained on multiple sources, at least 570 gigabytes of text, and it consists of 60% uh, common crawl, 22% web text, 8% uh, 8% books corpus, and 3% Wikipedia. And they have they actually have a few scenarios on doing downstream tasks. So downstream task mode could be divided into zero shot task, one shot task, and few shot task. So now they are now they are actually doing a they're using a bit more rigorous definition of zero shot, one shot, and few shot. So zero shot is so before in GPT-2, how they primed or conditioned the model for specific tasks is they just simply gave a few examples to the model and then hopefully it conditioned the model. But now they're actually saying it explicitly using text. So using there's like a gigantic GPT-3 model. There's GPT-3, GPT-3. And then in the first few texts, they tell the GPT-3 model what the user wants it to do. So translate English to French. So translate English to French and then give cheese. And then there's this special token. And then they want, what, what, should, what should come here? Like cheese, the, the translate, the French word for cheese is, I forgot, it's uh, what, uh, yeah, I forgot. I, I don't know what the cheese, what, what, what the cheese equivalent of the French word is. Basically, it's just telling the model that I want you to do. I want you to translate English to French. And then this is the English word. 
this is the Q sign, and then you just sample from you, you just sample from your, your your output token of what the French equivalent would be. So this is zero shot. It hasn't seen even a single example of Trent of English French pair. One shot is you still give the give the model the same Q, the same textual command or text description. And then one example, C otter in French is Lutre de Mar. And then you say cheese, and then what is, what is this? Few shot is, it's the same, same test description, and then few examples of English French pairs, and then you, you prompt, the, prompt the model to do, uh, do, do, do the translation. So zero shot, one shot, few shot. Oh, fromage, thanks. Yeah, I did. So yeah, this should be fromage. Thank you. All right, so the interesting thing is, so they have analyzed this into a few few scenarios, zero shot, one shot, and few shot. And you can see how large the model has become and what their conclusion is based on average performance across 42, 42 benchmark data sets. As they increase the size of the, of the, of the, of the model from 0 0.1 billion to 175 billion, the, uh, the few shot, one shot, zero shot test performance keeps rising and rising and rising. So there is no limit. They, they don't exactly know the limit because at the time of 175 billion parameters, it was still underfitting. The, the, language model, the language model objective was still underfitting. So there is more room to learn. And uh, a, few shot, a few shot examples, I mean, few shot mode gets better gain compared to zero shot mode. When increasing, when increasing the num the size of the uh, of the model, so you can see that the gradient or or or, or the, the yeah the trend is like high like higher in few shot mode than in zero shot mode. So we we actually don't know how how like how long this trend will actually continue. Like will will at, will at some point converge or will it shoot up? Like nobody really knows because nobody has the money to spend. Four million dollars per training. All right. So the now they have the so the, like so, so this is forty two average performance over forty two benchmark data sets. So there are some categories like question answering categories. Previous uh, previous uh, state of the art performance is forty four point five for natural question, web question, trivia question. These are all three different da data sets. And GPT three one shot few shot outperforms trivia QA. I mean, now performs the state of the art performance in this particular data set, even though it was not fine tuned at all. Like Reg is a very fine tuned specific using specific architecture for these web, uh, these question answering data sets. But zero, GPT-3 is not nothing like that at all. It's just language model pre-trained. Uh, it's, it's a language model trained to the like extreme, extreme end. And now it's using, and based on few shot, few shot exam, few shot mode, it can outperform the previous state of the art, which is just mind blowing. Uh, same deal with translation. It doesn't outperform the previous, it doesn't outperform all state of the art performances, but at least in French to English, GPT-3 few shot performs better than, better than state of the art, even supervised state of the art, but not in all cases still. But previously it's way better, but much better than GPT-2 because GPT-2 English French was 11.5 BLU. So, here it was 11.5 BLU for GPT-2, but in GPT-3 it's 32.6. So simply by, you know, increasing the size of the model, size of the model to 100 times, it can actually do this this better than before, which is just crazy. Uh, same with machine reading comprehension. Squad, there's squad here. There's other types of data sets and uh, fine tune. Uh, in, in machine reading comprehension, there's still some gap between the state of the art and GPT-3 few shot. At least in at least here, it's, the gap is not that great. But it but here, like 93.0 and 69.8 is there's still some some significant gap between the two here as well. So there are some 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 more. There is some like you know like rooms for improvement basically. Now uh, this is called super glue benchmark. So it's more difficult language under understanding tasks than glue. So it's even more trickier questions and trickier data sets. And you can see that uh, it performs BERT actually. So fine-tuned BERT and fine-tuned BERT large, like 
if you do few shot with 32 examples given as a, as a condition, and we're using 175 billion parameters, it can outperform fine-tuned BERT. So even without zero fine-tuning, it can outperform fine-tuned BERT, but, but, but not the fine-tuned soda though. And uh, as, you increase, as you increase the number of samples given to, given to the model as, as, as a context, like in few shot, in few shot mode, you can give one example, two examples, three examples, all the way to 32 examples. And you can see that uh, as soon as it sees eight examples, that it, it, it is already outperforming fine-tuned bird. So eight examples, 32 examples, the, the performance difference is not that significant, it's, it's marginal. Uh, this is exam this is interesting. So they generate fake text, text just like the fake news articles from the GPT-2, they generate fake articles using GPT-3 and they ask the humans to distinguish whether the generated texts are real or fake. So it's, it's like, GAN discriminator. So humans are GAN discriminators now. So uh, when the text is generated by a deliberately bad model, people were able to figure out fake text using uh, fake text at 86% accuracy. But when the fake texts are generated using the full 175 billion parameter GPT-3 model, people were confused like half, like all the time, all the time. So 52% accuracy means it's random guess. Given, given like you know, given like 50, 50, 50 real and fake fake text, achieving fifty two percent accuracy is like is random guessing. So it means that GPT three is able to generate texts that are as realistic as real ones, and there's no no way to tell for humans. There's no way to tell for humans to distinguish real from fake. So it means that GPT three can generate infinite amount of news articles or fake text or politi like, uh, political gen politically motivated text or, or religiously motivated text to you know, recruit ISIS combatants or, you know, or to motivate people to vote for Trump or vote for Biden. You know, people can just use GPT-3 to spam the internet and people won't be able to tell if the text is real or not. 뷰샷을 통해 테스트를 새롭게 이해하는 것인가요? 아니면 훈련한 점 변호사 알아낸 하나를 알았죠? So question is, uh, so the question is, is the GPT-3 model learning new thing by by looking at few shot examples, or is it just rediscovering something that has learned from pre-training 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 phase? And I would say it's the latter. So. Because it doesn't learn anything, it's not fine tuning anything. So there is no gradient updates or parameter updates. You have a fixed free fixed pre-trained model, and you're just conditioning or you're guiding the model to do a specific task. So it is rediscovering, or actually, it's not. It's not even rediscovering. It's just doing language model again. It's just auto regressively sampling the next text, but you are just priming it to do a specific way of sampling by giving few examples in the in the in the beginning so it means that the 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 message of, of gpt3 is that once you understand human language as well as gpt3 then you can do you can adapt to yeah you, you can adapt to new tasks really fast because gpt3 has trained on almost on the entire internet text like any text on internet it has seen during training. So if you understand human language distribution that to that extent, then you can quickly learn any language-based text. I mean, language-based tasks, downstream tasks, be it translation, question answering, text classification, inference, paraphrasing, doesn't matter. As long as it's language, language related, then you can do it with minimum minimum examples given to you. So it's just like human being. All right, yeah, so let's look at, uh, as yeah, we've already run 10 minutes overboard. So let's just look at some couple examples. So this is a text generated by uh, GPT-3 that has confused the humans most. So 12% accuracy. So a lot of people thought this was actual text generator actual text writ written by humans, not generated by GPT-3. So these uh, gray area was written by humans. 
So title, United Methodists agreed to historic split, subtitle, blah, 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 article, this is the Q sign that all the black text is, is generated by GPT-3. And obviously this is talking about uh, some denomination of uh, United, uh, United States Christian uh, Christian religion. They like they have like a uh, like a division within within themselves based on who based on like which which people oppose gay marriage and which people support gay marriage. So, and if you take a look at this, this is just intense in like crazy details were in, put into this text. Like after two days of intense debate, United Methodist Church has agreed to historic split. One that is affected and did yada 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 theological whatever like it is it, it, it is even citing the word LGBTQ. There's gay marriage, so obviously there's a heavy relationship between a gay marriage and LGBTQ. So GPT three understands there's some strong relation between gay marriage and LGBTQ. Like, like the whole text is very very consistent and on to the point. GPT three has an EY bigger architecture means we have no difference in parameter. Yeah. So there is zero architectural difference between GPT-1, 2, and 3. It's just more layers, bigger hidden dimension, more attention heads, and that's it. There's zero architectural change. It's just transformer decoder without the encoder decoder attention. And that's the beauty of this. You don't need any intuition or assumption or like, you know, advanced mathematics. You have just transformer trained on language modeling, which is again, very simple task. You're just predicting the next word, predicting the next word. And you just blow the size, the scale of that task to a crazy degree. And then you get this impressive result. So it means that you don't like models such as like models such as transformer, it doesn't have a lot of assumptions. Like CNN models have assumptions like local, like local features are important. That's the that's the assumption of CNN. Uh, RNN's assumption is sequence matters. Like our assumption is you, it's, it's inductive bias. The inductive bias of RNN is that everything comes in a sequence. So it, it, can, it can only learn sequential nature. So that is that is the assumption given to RNN. I mean, a lot of models in, in, the, in, the, in the real world have assumptions, but transformer doesn't, has, has limit, like has very little assumption. It's actually a set encoder, as I said. Without the position, positional encoding, it's a set encoder. So it has very little assumption. It's just everything is attending to everything else. And very little assumption, a model as model based on little assumption with very simple objective task blown up to crazy scale. And then now you see this. Unfortunately, the, the only downside of this these discovery, this, uh, discovery is that you can only do this, you can't do this unless you have a lot of money and a computer. Like unless you have money to burn for language modeling, you can't actually reproduce this. Like nobody will spend $4 million to do language modeling, which is crazy. So even though this is like a very impressive discovery, it is almost not reproducible. So it's just something good to look at. So this is a text most recognized by humans. So 61% of people were able to recognize that this much is a fake text. And you can see, ah, I think this is still good though. This is still, yeah, you can take, you can take a look at this later. I've uploaded this, this uh, material on Classum. I think this is the most interesting example of what GPT-3 can do. So it's called a use it in a sentence game. So what it is, is you just come up with a new unseen word, like some fake made up word, like what poo or fardoddle or baringo. These, don't, these words don't exist in the real world. And what you do is you use it in a sentence. A what poo is a small furry animal native to Tanzania. An example of a sentence that uses the word what poo is we were traveling in Africa and we saw these very cute what poos. So this is a human generated text. So people gave, so human user, gives uh, gives this example, this artificial example to the GPT-3 as, as a conditioning. And then what, and then the next time you tell, you, you force the model to this, do the same thing. So this time they come up with a to do, a far doddle means to jump up and down really fast. An example of a sentence that uses the word far doddle is, so is, is a Q sign. And now GPT-3 must use far doddle in a sentence 
that is consistent to the semantics of jumping up and down real fast. And let's see what GPT-3 generated. One day when I was playing tag with my little sister, she got really excited and she started doing these crazy, crazy far doddles. So this is a completely syntactically correct sentence and semantically it is also correct. Playing tag is, it, playing tag involves doing jump and, jumping and running and a, a lot of stuff. So you, it is okay, it is probably reasonable to use the word far doddle in the context of tag, tag being sulejaki. Even more interesting, even more impressive is the next one. A yalu balu is a type of vegetable that looks like a big pumpkin. An example of a sentence that uses the word yalu balu is now it's the Q sign and the word and the GPT-3 must generate a text, a sentence using yalu balu, which has which it has never seen before. I was on a trip to Africa and I tried this yalu balu vegetable that was ground that was grown in the garden there. It was delicious. And again, this is completely a legitimate sentence. And yalu balu is vegetable and it was grown in a garden. So that is also like very impressive. But I think the most impressive thing is if I, if my conjecture, if my imagination is correct, I think GPT-3 recognized that yalu balu sounds like a word that originates from, from African, African origin, like, like bubuzela or what, whatever, like African, like yalu balu sounds like a word that has, or, like, that has like of African, African co connotation. So that's why I think it used the word Africa out of all the out of all the pr places in the world. It used the word Africa. I was trip to, to I was on a trip to Africa and I tried this yellow bottle. I think that is, yeah. This this could be just my imagination. This could be my crazy imagination. But I think there's a high chance that because yellow bottle must be broken into yalu and balu in subword in subword embeddings. Maybe ya ya and lu and ba and lu. Maybe so. I think there is a high correlation between between these two. And there are, yeah, some more examples, but I won't go into detail. All right, so yeah, this is the end of today's class. Uh, we've ran, again, 17 minutes overboard. I'm sorry about that. Uh, are there any questions related to GPT-3, 2, or BERT, or even ELMO before I end this class? Yeah, I, we won't be doing, we won't be doing practice I mean, we won't be uh, like implementing or training GPT in practice session. This just like GPT-3 is just impossible. You, you can't, even GPT-2, I don't think you can fit GPT-2 in a single GPU. So we won't be doing that, but it's just, yeah, it's just something to look at and be impressed by rather than using it, unfortunately. Any question? All right, if not, then yeah, this is the end of the class today. I'll see you guys this Thursday and thank you very much. Bye-bye.